Cold Steel isn't normally known for their nuanced blades that handle like the originals. Rather, they're usually pretty overbuilt heavy beaters. But every now and then, they do a good job and get a winner. Let's see if the one I'm looking at today is one of those winners. Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tude, and today I'm taking a look at the Cold Steel Indian Tawar, a type of sword that I am very unfamiliar with. So, Cold Steel. I'm sure you're at least passingly familiar with them. Their swords typically aren't very historically accurate, part of the reason being because they don't actually make them themselves. They contract out to a variety of forges and provide the specs, and then those forges make the swords. This one, I believe, is produced by Windless. I'll get more into why I think that in a little bit. The MSRP of this sword is $320, although you can usually find it for around $270. I didn't buy it new, however. I bought it secondhand from somebody who had just bought it new. So it's basically new, but secondhand. One thing about this model that's a little confusing is that Cold Steel seems to have several different versions of it. I've seen reports from people that they got one of these Cold Steel Indian Tawars and it had the, the same blade as one of their other sabers. And that saber blade is a known overly built, overly heavy sword. So it can be kind of hard to tell what exactly you're getting when you order this sword. So one thing that can make this kind of a hard sell for Cold Steel is that you can actually buy Tawars from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries for roughly $300 to $500. So why buy a reproduction when you can get an original? Well, some people don't want to cut with antiques. They see it as disrespectful to the history and potentially damaging the sword. Other people just don't want to be the caretaker of what might be considered an important historical artifact. There could be any number of reasons why you would prefer a production sword over an antique. And really, it's up to the individual to decide if they would rather have something like this or one that was an original. Like I said at the beginning of this review, I'm not very familiar with Tawars. From what I understand, it is, the name Tawar is derived from a Sanskrit word that means single-edged sword. I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I know I'd butcher it, so I'll put it up here. Like many sword names we use today, Tawar kind of translates to sword in a variety of languages, such as Hindi, Punjabi, and others. So a Tawar is a single-edged blade that usually has a curve, although there are some that have, are completely straight. Generally speaking, if it has a very shallow curve, it would be called a Sorohi. But again, these names are kind of fluid. Tawars are characterized by this very distinctive grip. Now, not all of them have the knuckle bow here, but they do pretty much all have this disc pommel and a all metal hilt. These would have been used both on horseback and on foot. And on foot, you would probably pair it with a shield. With the disc pommel, you're pretty much forced into a hammer grip. You can't really do any other type of grip. So this is mostly used for draw cuts and then also kind of stabbing around shields. So the Tawar comes with a leather sheath and the fit is actually quite good. There's pretty much no rattle here and very good retention. And when I say, said earlier that this was probably made by Windless, it's the sheath that pretty much tells me that because it has all the hallmarks of a Windless leather sheath. It's got that same leather feel to it and it's a couple plastic inserts in here to help with the retention. Because it's just leather, it, there's no wood core, it doesn't really work for long-term storage. The oil on the blade can actually get, in, get soaked up by the leather make the leather rot some, take the oil off the blade, and then end up rusting it. And therefore, these sheaths are just not particularly useful to me. Now, this one does look a lot nicer than most windless sheaths because of the, the cast brass decorations on here. And it's, I would say, better than most windless sheaths, but it's still just not that good. So let's take a look at the hilt. This is all cast brass, and it's cast pretty nicely. There's a lot of detail here that you can make out, and while there are some flaws 
and pitting and you can see the casting lines where they cleaned them up. It's pretty nice. It, it looks really nice. It's very comfortable in the hand. Being a hammer grip, there's pretty much no problem with edge alignment. It's very easy to keep in the hand. I can't rotate my the sword at all. You know, I can keep a good strong grip. Again, hammer grip helps with that. The construction is a little interesting because this pommel is clearly a different piece. And then this little end piece here is actually a cap over a nut. There's The tang is threaded and it's all screwed together. So you could theoretically disassemble this. And actually here's a picture of the hilt disassembled by my friend, brother Nathaniel. One uh, kind of problematic thing actually about the hilt is these lingettes make it really hard to get oil onto the steel beneath them. So what I actually did is when I got this, there was a pretty thick layer of grease down there from the, from the factory. And I just left that grease on. That way I don't have to worry about it rusting because I can't get oil down there. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So unlike a lot of cold steel and windless swords, this sword features a lot of distal taper. It starts nearly eight millimeters thick and then rapidly tapers for the first third of the blade or so, and then generally tapers a little bit more gradually down to a very thin and effective cutting plane. And this leads to a blade that has a, a decent amount of flex, but the base of the blade is nicely stiff, as you want in a sword. Another reason I think this is a windless blade is the finish looks like pretty much every windless sword. It's kind of halfway between a satin and a mirror polish, and it shows scuffs very easily, as pretty much every windless sword I've, I have experience with does. But it's still an attractive look. Now the surfaces of the blade have a ton of ripples on them. I mean, a crazy amount of ripples. And actually, I can just run my fingers along the surfaces of the blade and I feel the ripples. That's how not flat the planes are. And I can do that on the spine as well. If I run my fingers along it, I can feel it rippling. You know, that doesn't really affect the performance of the sword at all, at least not that I've seen, but it is kind of a lack of a final finish that would bring the, the sword into a nicer place, but it would also bring the price up. So the sword does come sharp, but it does come with a secondary bevel, which starts right around where the langettes end. It's a pretty even secondary bevel, and it's pretty damn sharp too. It does waver around a little bit, but it's not too bad. Let's take a look at some paper cutting tests. Just insert the sword and then slice. Very even. There's uh, pretty much no downward pressure there. I'm pretty much just letting the sword slice through the paper. That's what you want. That's what I want to see when it comes to sword test cutting paper. I don't expect it to just completely slice through the paper like there's absolutely nothing there, but I expect it to be a very smooth, even cut. Something I don't really do with swords, but other people find very interesting is destructive testing. My friend brother Nathaniel actually tested his cold steel tawar against a variety of targets, including a steel shield. And I'm gonna put a couple pictures up here showing his results. He basically bashed the sword into the steel shield and the only damage to the sword was a tiny, tiny glint in one spot. That's pretty impressive durability in my books. So let's take a look at some cutting footage.
as you saw there, the Talwar cuts very, very well. Even in my inexperienced hands, you know, I'm not used to using this type of sword and this style of draw cuts, and yet it cut very well. I was very impressed. So I don't really have much in the way of comparisons with this Cold Steel Tawar because it's the only sword of this type that I have any experience with. What I can say is that I know with this style of sword, you use a hammer grip. You, know, you can't do the more handshake grip that I'm more comfortable with. You can't flick the wrist out at all. You have to keep it locked in the hammer grip because this disc guard, disc pommel, whatever you want to call it, would bite into your hand and it just doesn't let you do that. So you do basically all draw cuts rather than, you know, the, I can't even show because I can't do it, rather than the type of cutting that I'm used to with uh, European swords and even, you know, Japanese swords and that kind of thing. So I'm pretty unfamiliar familiar with how to use these swords, but I gotta say, it works really well. It popped that pool noodle apart very easily and I got several silent cuts on water bottles with a sword that I'm not familiar with. That's pretty impressive. That means it's very sharp and it just, it works really well. It feels good. You know, it's not particularly heavy. It's balanced. It's gonna be balanced probably fairly far out for, no, actually not too bad. It's kind of hard to see because of the guard, but yeah, it's actually balanced not as far out as I thought it would be. And it's got a lot of distal taper. It starts quite thick and narrows and gets really thin right at the cutting point, which makes for slightly flexible, but not crazy flexible. And, you know, I don't know this type of sword very well, but I can say it works very well. It feels good when I'm using it correctly. It, it'll tell you very quickly if you use it wrong, because if you try to do a cut with the, using the wrist, this is gonna dig into your hand and feel really bad really quickly. So it really does lock you in to that, those draw cuts. Now, one thing I've seen is that the way uh, a lot of people that would use this type of sword would practice with it, I am terrible at this, so don't laugh. So you actually put one hand, leg up on like a tree or something and you just, you tried to do cuts without touching the tree. Except I'm terrible at that. Don't use my uh, example as the way to do it. I'll put a link to Matt Easton's uh, example of how to do it. He's much better at it, even though I think he's not particularly familiar either. He's just more athletic and better <laughs> than I am at pretty much everything regarding swords. So overall, it's a lot of fun to use, cuts very well, and for a cold steel, sword this is actually very impressive you know a lot of cold steel swords don't really implement proper distal taper or really do much to be authentic to the types of swords they are they oftentimes are just big overbuilt swords that are more modern in intake and don't really care about historical accuracy now again i'm not particularly familiar with this type of sword but I can tell just from the experience I've had with swords that this feels right. This, this doesn't feel heavy, doesn't feel clunky. It still has power to it. it. It just feels good and it's fun to use. So now it's time to talk bottom line. Is this sword worth the MSRP of $320? Well, possibly, but frankly, I think I should consider it a $270 sword since that's generally what it's available at. In that case, yes, I do think it's worth it. This is a lot of fun to use, very effective, and quite an attractive sword to boot. It's not a type that you're gonna see a lot of on the market, but I think it actually is very well designed with a lot of distal taper, something that you don't see in this budget price range from manufacturers and or brands like Cold Steel. And it's a fun sword. I really enjoyed using it. Frankly, it's hard to beat the, this kind of performance in this price range. And that's pretty much going to wrap up this review. Keep an eye out on Unchi Sword Reviews. This sword's gonna make its way over to them so that they can do a review of it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they think of it. But until next time, Alien 2 out.